OK. So this is lecture 10 of ECE 5312. OK. And so this lecture, um, what, what we're going to do is we're going to break the shackles of dealing with signals in w the waveform domain, in the time domain. We're going to vectorize everything. So this, like, I have to apologize for, for this lecture and the next two because there's going to be a lot of like math here and there and everywhere. But, and you might say, oh my god, this is time to fall asleep. No, 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 no. What we're going to do is it's actually really straightforward. So we're going to use a combination of, you know, I'm going to go through the lecture slide and say, huh? And then I'm going to draw it out and say, ah, OK. So what we're going to do is, even though the title of this, this lecture is called Optimal Receive, it turns out it's better that we, like, before we even jump into receiver design, we understand several things. So in lecture 10, this lecture, we're going to be talking about taking, vec uh, taking waveforms, signal waveforms, and who wants to do trig all day? No, 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 no. We're going to vectorize everything. So this lecture, we talk about this concept of signal vectors. And we're going to look at a few modulation schemes and how, oh, in the vector domain, it's so much more easier. How many people here like linear algebra? Hey! How many people here like trig identities, especially when they're multiplied against each other and then you have to integrate across them? No! And then lecture 11 is beautiful because we build upon it. We look at a few more examples of vectorizing the same exact modulation schemes we looked at in the last several lectures. We'll then look a little bit at um, uh, like what, what's after that. So we have those modulation schemes. We'll look at a side-by-side -side comparison between a waveform space and the vector space, and then we'll figure out, okay, in order to create those vectors, there's something that we need to create, which is called the orthonormal basis functions. <gasps> orthonormal basis functions. And how do we get them? There's something called Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. So if you take my undergrad course, you've already seen that. Um, if you haven't, then this will be some nice exposure. And then finally, in the last lecture, we'll look at um, the how do we represent noise in a channel entirely in the vector domain. And what does it mean in terms of the probability density function, the PDF? So this is going to be sort of the groundwork before we jump into actually analyzing receiver structures. All right? OK. Hey, OK. So there's a lot of math here. And I think you know the, the temptation for me is right now to go to the to the whiteboards. You, you know it. Like Everyone knows, like, hey, yeah, Professor Wiglinski really just wants to uh, draw on the whiteboard because I don't have something like this at home, right? So, OK. But so let's say we, we w w the bottom line is this. What happens is that we can represent any waveforms. Oh, no. Ooh, I'm electronically erasing it. Eee. OK. What we're trying to do is we're going to try and represent any time domain waveform as a weighted combination, OK? So what happens is, let's say we have j is equal to 1 to n. And then we have something called si j. And then we have phi j dt. And you might say, OK, what is this thing? There are several key elements here. What happens is this guy here, as we'll look at right now, is called the orthonormal normal basis function. Okay. This guy here is one of the weights against the orthonormal basis function. As we'll see later on, this actually is the amount of our vector, signal vector, S i of t, that projects onto that basis function phi j. So whenever we see phi in this course, phi j in this part of the course, this is the orthonormal basis. And so you might say, what do you mean by orthonormal basis? Like this. Everyone knows that this guy here should be, that should be x, that should be y, that should be z, right? And we know from, uh, let's say from, um, from years ago, if you took like pre-calc, this is your little orthonormal basis function i, this is your little orthonormal basis j, and that's a little orthonormal basis k, right? Except that here, what we've got instead is that supposedly is phi 1 of t, the waveform, right? So what happens is we now have 
let's say, some waveform, and we want to know how much of is con how much of it is contained in that waveform. And then we can graphically represent it as this distance in this direction. We then have another orthonormal basis function, phi 2 of t, and another one, phi 3 of t. So look, look what happens. So if, let's say we take, let's use green. If we take this sij business, right? And I'm multiplying it against one of these phi j's. And the sum of them produces si of t. What am I doing? What am I doing is I'm doing a weighted combination of each of these three orthonormal basis functions to create a waveform. What I'm basically doing is I can create any waveform in terms of a weighted combination of these phi functions. So how does that look? Let's, what, how do we represent all of this? Easily, using the green ink. <laughs> what happens is this guy here is a vector. This is S, let's say, I1, SI2, SI3. So this tells me this SI1, that's the amount of, let's say, the, the signal SI in that direction that contains phi1, SI2, the amount of SI that's contained in phi2. And then, uh, as you can see, I really should draw better. Uh, boop. Try again. Let's do, do do over. And then one more. This guy here is S. Oh, phew, for a minute that that was mine. Um, and this guy here is S I three. And this here, if we draw a vector, that vector is actually, we can call it S I the vector, and it's represented by these guys here. So let me erase that because that's confusing. SI1, SI2, SI3. Perfect. So what this tells me is that the phi1 wave becomes phi2. Again, same story. How much of my waveform can be represented by phi 2? And that amount becomes the second element of my vector. Finally, phi 3, same story. How much of phi 3 can be, can be contained in SI? And that amount becomes a coefficient, the third coefficient of my vector. So now, if I go and talk with any digital communication system, transmitter or receiver, and as long as we're on the same wavelength, <laughs> Sorry, bad pun. But what happens is, if we're on the same page in terms of agreeing on what our orthonormal basis functions are, all I need is just the vector. Here, here's my vector coefficients. Here's my vector coefficients. Here's my vector coefficients. I don't need to communicate cosines and sines. That's, that's irrelevant. All I need is if everyone agrees on the same axis. So whenever you talk with mathematicians or engineers and stuff, we talk about x, y, z, Cartesian coordinates. Um, suppose I want to talk with Bengi here. But let's forget about Cartesian. Let's talk about spherical coordinates. Totally different, right? So we're going to have rho, we're going to have phi, and we're going to have theta. We're going to have a different type of coordinate system. But we agree on the basis functions, right? So we want to establish a frame of reference in which we can decompose signals into sort of like amounts of these basis functions. What, so what's orthonormal? So let's, let's take this one step further. Orthonormal. So orthonormal functions, ah, uh, come on, behave. So orthonormal. So if it's orthogonal, everyone knows what orthogonal is, right? 90 degrees out of phase with each other, or basically, if you try and do the dot product of two ortho, ortho, orthogonal vectors, they don't project, right? This guy does not project onto this guy. 90 degree angle, they're orthogonal. And then let's say we have another vector like this. Oh yeah, he's orthogonal to him. And, and it's weird because you know, in Cartesian coordinates, when we talk about three dimensional space, we usually refer to like 90 degrees as orthogonal, right? Um, it is possible. And, 
I've, I think some of, the homework, some of the problems I posted on the course website talk about four-dimensional space. You can have any dimensional space in terms of orthonormal basis functions as long as everyone sticks to the plan. And say, here are my orthonormal basis functions. Could be five, six, seven, eight, nine um, waveforms. And if you can represent every one of the signals you want in terms of those basis functions, you just send the vector saying, here are the coefficients, here are the coefficients. Now, orthonormal is a different beast. If I do the integral of phi i t and phi j t dt, orthonormal means that when I do the dot product here, I get one, I get unity when i equals j, and I get zero otherwise, right? And it, it's just like when you looked in your pre-calculus class, the little i hat, j hat, k hat. This is different, right? These were the orthonormal basis. These were the orthonormal vectors for your Cartesian coordinate space, right? The little i hat, what was special about it? When you took the dot product with itself, it gave you 1. In fact, remember what we said about this type of integral. This is a dot product. This is the projection of phi i t onto phi j t. And if they're orthogonal, they don't project. And if they're one and the same, it should be unity length. Right. OK. So let's go back to our slides. So what, what I just written on the, on the whiteboard and, and I agree upon a set of waveforms that can completely characterize any waveform that's produced by my transmitter, I can write it as this e summation equation over here. And then all I need to do, the lingua franca of, let's say, receiver with transmitter with another receiver using the same orthonormal basis functions is just the vector of those weights. Beautiful. Ha! Huh. But it gets better. Oh, yeah, it gets much better. So first of all, how do you find phi k. And it's very easy. All you do is you take the dot product of the vector. So if we go back to the diagram, if you take the, 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 the uh, blah. So if you take it, like let's say here is s, let's say 1 of t, right? And so what you want to do is, let's say this is phi 1 of t, let's say that is phi 2 of t, and then this is phi 3 of t. What do you do? You dot product. It's, you see how much, oh, come on, behave. How much of that waveform projects into this direction? Likewise, if there is any amount of this that projects into phi 2, you try and project there as well. And then finally, of course, there's this amount that projects onto phi 3. So it's just the amount of weighing. So how do you accomplish that? What you do is you take, like, you know, again, the, the integral across the time period, and you say s1 of t, or s, sorry, ooh, si of t, si of t, and then phi i of t, uh, let's say j of t. And then dt. So you're doing the dot. This is the dot product. Now, um, it's interesting. Remember the representation that we can have here. This is equal to this little guy, the summation of, let's say, from k equals 1 to n, phi i k, and then phi k t, right? And remember the definition of what orthonormal is. So if we take this guy and do the integral 0 to t and then you have the summation of k s i k and then phi k t phi j t d t and what you can do it's cool you can actually move the integral to the inside so it applies only to this what is that definition this will only be 
non-zero, it will be equal to 1 when k is equal to j. So this is going to be equal, this will not be equal to 0 when k is equal to j. And that gives you that coefficient. It's beautiful, elegant mathematics. So, so why, why are we making such a big deal of it? I know, so, I know a, lot of, a lot of the students that I advise, they say, oh, I don't want to take lineal And you know, based on my experiences in my past, when I've taken linear algebra, it's been frightening. You know, I feel like, oh my god, like all these things I have to remember. <gasps> what do I do now? But, but in all honestly, honesty, this will simplify a lot of things. It allows you to visualize, which a lot of engineers are. We're a very, we're a very visual learning bunch here. And so if we rewrite our signals in terms of these coefficients, this actually lends itself to quite a nice sort of a mathematical analysis later on. In fact, from this point onwards, a lot of math that we're going to deal with will be vectorized, okay? Especially the optimal detector. So now, on this slide, on slide two, like, you know, there's a lot of stuff here that, that again, is kind of frightening and it's like, what's this? Like, for instance, like, uh, you remember this guy, what's rho ij? Correlation coefficient. Again, it's the projection of two waveforms. It turns out, when, once we start vectorizing stuff, that things like, for instance, the correlation coefficient, what's correlation in general is a dot product. I'm projecting, right? How much of one is contained? To phi ij, what I'm doing is I'm taking si vector dot sj vector. And it produces a scalar number. So remember, does everyone remember what, how dot product works? Take the coefficients, corresponding coefficients from two vectors, multiply them together, each pair, and then sum the result. That will give you the dot product. All right? So from this, um, this is actually powerful stuff because you can calculate the correlation. You can calculate the energy. Is the energy? It's the vector dotted with itself, which happens to be equal to its length squared. So the double, the norm squared. And then what happens is, as a result, remember that d min calculation? Remember this guy? Remember how we had to calculate it with, oh my god, I have to integrate from 0 to t, this thing squared, and it has a cosine. Oh, what's my trig blah, 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 blah. If you vectorize at the beginning before jumping into the rest of the math, What's, what's EI? SI dot SI. What's EJ? SJ dot SJ. I, I'm hoping everybody here knows how to multiply and add. Okay, good. Now, last part. Minus 2 rho IJ. SI dot SJ. Ah, great. So what happens is with just a few dot products, like your quizzes, which take 20 minutes to do, I'm going to change the time limit. Now it's going to be five minutes with vectorization. Okay? No, no, no. Just kidding. Just kidding. I see shaking of heads. No, no. So, <laughs> so what happens is, but in all reality, the first thing it does is it makes math tractable. Especially, you might say, well, how do you take care of sines and cosines, professor? There's an example I'll work out where what happens if your basis functions is a sine omega ct and a cosine omega ct? <gasps> you take those sinusoids out. You don't have trig identities to worry about anymore. Vectorized. Yeah. So that's what you do. So what happens is if you do that, in fact, how about we do that right now? Yeah, right now. OK. What we're going to do is let's do 16 QAM, which if you heard from my lecture, I forgot which lecture it was. I think it was lecture 8, which was done between 10 and 10.30 at night. Let's do 16 QAM. OK. No, but in reality, <laughs> that's what happens. Like, you know, I'm not a night owl. Well, used to be, but some, sometimes I am. So here, you might say, OK, what am I going to do? I am going to take this guy. And we all know how this guy is represented. So let's, I'm going to work this out first on the board. And then you'll see, oh, the math makes a lot of sense. OK. So what happens is we have 16 QAM. And we remember how that works, right? So we have Sij of t is equal to Ai cosine omega ct plus bj sine omega ct. So this modulation scheme, as I explained in my, the online recording that I did earlier this week, 
This thing's beautiful because it combined two forms. Analog waveform manipulation to cram in information into this scheme and, and yet get a wonderful power efficiency for a two-dimensional modulation scheme that everybody now uses. And the beauty of this guy is what? What happens is, first of all, I'm playing around with amplitude, but on a cosine, and then another amplitude on a sine that are orthogonal to each other. So it's like a checkerboard of possible signal constellation points, right? So the amplitude displacement, that's along the x value. And the b is the y value. As I mentioned, lecture, God, I'm, tr I'm trying to think. It's lecture 8. So graphically, how does this look like? And we saw this before. Or maybe we haven't, but now we will. Let's say it's 16 QAM. So it's almost like Battleship, if you ever played that game. Or saw the movie recently in theaters. What happens is you have a grid. You have all these points. And how do you select a point? It's like, OK, cosine amplitude AJ, or no, sorry, AI. So let's say it's this guy here, this place here. But it could be any one of those four points displaced in that direction. Then, oh, the sign says it's BJ. BJ is that guy. So all I need is this two amplitudes to say, zing, that point. But I have a sine and a cosine. That's, that's, that's nasty. Imagine, OK, class, let's calculate the power efficiency of this thing. And everyone's like, Right? Because what happens is, take that guy, take some other guy, take the square of those two, math out, out the nose and everything. It's really awful. So what do we want to do? Now I'm going to forget this equation, so I better record it. So what we want to do is, let phi 1, here's my sneaky solution. Let phi 1 be equal to the square root of 2 over t. And you might say, why 2 over t, professor? I'll get there in a minute. So omega ct. And then phi 2 is square root of 2 over t sine omega ct. So graphically, what do we have here? We have this guy. That's our phi 1 of t. And that's phi 2 of t. So now, you might ask yourself, let's vectorize this guy. How do we do it? So what happens is, how do we get, so the, the goal is, how do we get, in this case, uh, we, we go from the waveform, Sij of t, how do we go to the waveform, uh, sorry, the vector, Si, the vector, right? And that Si the vector will be equal to Sij, right? And, th and then it will be element 1, and then Sij element 2 for the phi 1 and phi 2, right? And, and in fact, that's really messy notation. It can be simplified. So, so the thing is, why did we, so the, the first question that should come to mind is, why in the world, OK, so, so, so every, does everyone sort of see why I chose phi 1 to be equal to that and phi 2 to be equal to that approximately. Forget about the stuff in front. Does everyone sort of see that? The reason why, so there, there's, there, there, there's one thing, like I'm, I kind of like, like, you know, if you can see through intu a little bit through intuition and, and you, 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 you're good in math, what you see is cosine and sine are orthogonal to each other. So they're like a dead giveaway saying, yeah, I'm going to use those as my basis functions because they're already 90 degrees out of phase. I don't have to build my own. Later on tonight, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about how to make your own orthogonal, orthogonal basis functions. Now, the problem is cosine and sine are orthogonal, but they're not orthonormal. So what do we do? So what we do is the following. So what happens is we have all that constant stuff in front. And why is that? Well, here's why. So let's say I'm naive, and I say, OK, this is orthonormal, and this is cosine omega ct, and that is sine 
omega CT. And you might say, okay, I'm happy. Looks good, right? Mm -mm. Because what happens is, let's say I take this guy and this guy and integrate from 0 to t dt. What do I get? Well, I'm integrating, right, cosine dt. And this, we know, is equal to 0. Because if you use the trig identity, what's a cos times a sine? That's going to be equal to sine. It's, there's not going to be any dc term, but it's going to be um, sine double frequency term, and that goes to 0. Whew. OK, I remember my trig. See, c trig is not fun. No, just kidding. And I'm being recorded. No, just kidding. So what happens is, what happens if I do phi 1, phi 1? Ah, phi 1. Come on, behave. So what you've got is cos omega ct, cos omega ct dt. And so what is this? What's cos times a cos? It's cos squared, right? So it's going to be equal to half plus half cos 2 times omega ct, right, dt. We know that that goes to 0. And so what we get, ah, uh, sad, what we get is t over 2. So unless t is equal to 2, this is not unity, right? So what happens is, let's say we take this t over 2 and take the square root because we're multiplying cos by itself, right? So the trick is, if we now take these guys and we put in red 2 over t and 2 over t, problemo solved, right? OK, good. So now, going back to the example. So that's really why we choose these two basis functions, because they obviously are orthogonal, right? And then we just need to make sure that they're orthonormal. Right? Orthogonal is not good enough. We have to have orthonormal. So given that, what we do, <laughs> this is what we do. We go crazy. What happens is let's take that representation, and let me bring it down so everyone can see it too. So what happens is I take Sij of t, and I see where is the low-hanging fruit? Where can I represent Sij of t in terms of phi? 1 of t and phi 2 of t, and lo and behold, we've got something here, folks. What we have, so you might notice some weirdness up on high. Like you notice I'm multiplying and dividing by some, some terms, and the reason is, and this, this could be perfect as a Seinfeld episode, I'm doing nothing. And you might say, what? You know, no, seriously. I actually saw him in, in Las Vegas last year, and Honest to goodness, I'm not sure who's vibrating. No, no. So, and uh, honest to goodness, I actually thought that he was way better in stand-up comedy than in Seinfeld. I mean, way better. I think everyone else was a distraction. No, trust me, this was, it was pretty good. The guy who was also started off was pretty good. But what happens is, let's say you take Sij of t, and that is equal to Ai cosine omega ct plus bj sine omega ct. And then you say to yourself, OK, how can I fit? I'm going to write in the corner here. S1, which is equal to square root of 2t, right, omega ct. And then phi 2 of t, square root, sine omega ct. And you say, OK, well, obviously, I see this guy very clearly and that guy very clearly. So what I want to do, but the only thing is, I have this problem. I don't have this or this. How do you create something from nothing? Ha. Huh. And the answer is, I put something there. Like, let's say, two, square root of 2 over t. And then I also do square root of t over 2. They cancel each other out. Ha, 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 my little bag of tricks. I do the same thing here and here. So now I say, oh, look at this. And oh, yeah, my favorite of all the markers. That guy and that guy are my phi i's, right? This guy here is phi 1 of t. That guy here is phi 2 of t. Et voila. What you've got is 
ai square root of 2 over t by 1 of t and bj square root two over, uh, t over 2 by 2 t. So what you've got, essentially, if you do this little trick, now I can take this one step further. Now my sij vector, given that I have a common basis, is equal to ai square root t over 2 bj square root t over 2. This now is my vector. And look how beautiful this is, right? I have an amplitude in both the phi 1 and phi 2 dimensions. And I have some term in order to make sure that everything is kosher in terms of the orthonormal basis functions. But what I get, essentially, is these beautifully spaced out dots. Wait, where is it? Let me go back to this guy. So it's really quite nice. Like what you get essentially is this grid where I can represent every one of these waveforms as an amplitude in the horizontal, amplitude in the vertical, and that's it. I just need two amplitudes, and I have my entire modulation scheme derived, right? And then, if I want to compute things like the minimum Euclidean distance and stuff, all are super straightforward. Or the energy. So let's see the energy. Let's find the energy of a single signal constellation point. What is it? Si dot Si. In this case, it's Sij dot Sij. That gives me the energy of Sij. What is it? It's a dot product and then the sum. So what happens is it becomes, if you take this vector, you dot it with itself, you sum the elements together, Boom! You get this guy here. I think in one of the lectures, I think it was lecture nine, when I talked about MREQAM, and people talk about, like, you know, if you saw the lecture and you said, where did he get the angle brackets, the averages across all the AIs and the BJs? Where did that come from? It comes from here. If you vectorize it, what you've got is you have this amplitude, and you've got that amplitude, and then what's the average? It's going to be the average of all these guys, right? So it's going to be at the average. What's the only thing that changes? Is the AI squares and the BJ squares. So when you have that, and then you do the D-min, what's this? Vectorize. This is a vector distance, right? So, what's, so you take the vector and you find the norm of that vector. Subtraction. Take this guy and sub no, take this guy and subtract him from this guy, and then take his distance, the norm squared. And what you get, what you get at the end of the day, is some really beautiful stuff because from all those calculations, so if you work it all out, what you get, that's good. That corresponds to the waveform space. So. Everyone sort of like says, yeah, I think that looks right. Double check, right? Then take the D-mins. And what you'll find out is that at the end, if you take the minimum Euclidean distance, what you get at the end of the day, first of all, you take the difference of the two waveforms. So it's vector subtraction. And then you take the norm squared of it. And what you're going to get is this. And everyone should remember, oh yeah, that's true. In 16 QAM, the minimum Euclidean distance between two points is equal to 2A squared T. Did we have to do any trig identities? Did we have to do any double frequency terms? Absolutely not. Oh, yeah. So, okay. So now, if we work through all of this, if we want to try the other approach for D min squared, the correlation approach, also good. And if you work it out, the math is the same. And this average energy, so this I also mentioned in lecture 9. So imagine someone gives you 256 qualm. <gasps> Do you have to calculate the energies for 256 signal constellation points and then average it out? Absolutely not. Use your noodle. I, in fact, I, I'm almost tempted to give you guys, as your quiz for next week, calculate the energy. And let's see who, let's see how smart people are, or listening, and say, okay, well, point one. 250. And then what happens is, I want to see how far people get. But what happens is, oh no, that's so cruel. If you look at the symmetry, 
the vector thing. So what's the energy of your signal? The energy really is the distance squared from the origin to the signal constellation point. It's a hypotenuse. So here's AI, BJ. Find out what the hypotenuse is squared. That gives you the energy. Beautiful, right? None of this like integral over a period and cosines and sines. It's very straightforward. And if you just, so how, how many calculations can we do this in? Do we have to calculate every point? No. Three points. Uno, dos, tres. And then multiply by the corresponding number of points. That will give you the energy. Happy. <sighs> so when you do all of this stuff, at the end of the day, you get the power efficiency equal to 8 fifths. And that jives with the waveform. So this example, so what have we done? So what we've done, so everyone's like saying, wow, what did Professor Ruglinski do? OK, so this is what Professor Ruglinski did. Um, what I did is vectors. Who will win? This will almost be vectors. It will almost rival Puppy Bowl in terms of like, you know, viewership. What happens is, remember in the waveform space, Okay, waveforms, and this is vectors. So waveforms, calculate d min squared. What do you do? Integrate from 0 to t, delta s t squared dt. And then we have the average symbol energy, which is equal to the sum across all individual symbol energies times the probability that those symbols occur. Right, And then we find the average bit energy by dividing the average symbol energy by the number of bits. And then the power efficiency of the modulation scheme is d min squared divided by the average bit energy. Now for vectors, for vectors, what's d min squared? You have several approaches. You can do s i, right, dot s i plus s j dot s j minus 2 s i dot s j. So essentially, that here is my correlation of i, j, right? And, or you can try another way, which is essentially the norm of s i, the vector, minus s j, the vector squared. As for the average, uh, as for the energy of s i, well, that should be s i dot s i. And then from that, you can find the average by taking you know, the same equation as this and then solving for it. And then find out what the power efficiency, exactly the same thing. And that's what we're also going to see in the next lecture. So, so what we saw, like what I would recommend all of you doing is try this out at home. Solve for the power efficiency of 16 QAM using vectors only. So first thing you may want to do, just like what we just shown in the derivation, Go from the waveform representation to a vector representation. That's usually the hardest part, because afterwards, everything is just lin-alge, right? And it's dot products. And, and so you don't have to worry about any sort of messy integrals and stuff after getting your orthonormal basis functions, right? OK. So that, so that kind of wraps up. And, and the, these things here, the OKs and stuff, these are sanity checks to make sure that we're on target. OK, so that concludes lecture 10. Yay. And now it's stopping. So what we'll do, I don't even know what time it is. I look at that.